I'm David Rowe, I'm the Director of Digital Matters, and it's my honor to introduce Jeremy Brown, who is an Associate Research Professor at Brigham Young University in the Office of Digital Humanities. And today he's going to be talking about the Women's Exponent Advertising Database. Jeremy, yeah. without further ado. Thank you, David, and thank you for having me. Um, I mean, how far back do we go? <laughs> my, the minute I stepped into Utah, you're constantly. <laughs> <laughs> we've been we've been collaborating on various things for years. It's been a lot of fun, um, and it's great to see Rebecca and Anna here as well, some old-time friends. Um, and those of you online, welcome as well. Uh, so oh, I, I want to go over a little bit of the format of the presentation today because I, I really want this to be interactive. And I've ordered what we're going to go over in terms of what was advertised. So we can spend the whole time talking about the finished product. Um, and then have a little bit of time to talk about the technology behind it. Um, and then you'll for, totally forget about uh, you know, the, this, this commentary that I have at the end. That's not important. Um, and so if you have questions about the database or about its uses or some of the research we've done with it, or if you have ideas, please go ahead and stop, raise your hand or, or uh, give a comment to Comstock and we'll make sure to involve everyone here because I, I really do want this to be interactive. All right, so who am I and what do I do? As David said, I'm Jeremy Brown. I'm an associate research professor in the Office of Digital Humanities at BYU. Uh, before coming to BYU in 2012, I was at SUNY Brockport, which is near Rochester, New York. Um, and then this is what I do, or more specifically, what I have done at BYU. These are a collection of most of the projects that I've worked on while I was there. Um, like 3D printed cuneiform tablets. That was a fun one uh, for TJ, who does the, the 3D printing here. Um, and some of these have been in collaboration with people here at, at BU and, and others with other people. I'll bring this back at the end, though. So let's talk about the Exponent Advertisement Database. The finished product is a website where you can search 4,000 advertisements that appeared in the Women's Exponent newspaper between 1872 and 1914, which is the entire run of the newspaper in Salt Lake City. There are 112 vendors and 12 industries that I just coded myself. Um, I would like to go back and redo that with like a um, uh, Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics kind of taxonomy instead of just one that I threw together. But um, uh, let's take a look at it. Let's just, let's, there it is. Woo. All right. So I hope the, uh, the screen sharing is working and uh, following this. But you have just a simple search field where you can limit the, uh, the years that you're interested in. You have um, specific industries that you can select. Uh, you can browse by year, industry, or vendor. You can make some pretty simple graphs, which we'll get to in a little bit, that just show the frequency of advertisements by industry. There's an about page, which includes acknowledgement to Digital Matters and the Willard J. Uh, Marriott Library, University of Utah. Um, and so because this project grew out of the effort in 2019, uh, to redigitize the women's exponent newspaper in time for the sesquicentennial of women voting in Utah. Those celebrations were kind of curtailed by the pandemic, unfortunately. Uh, but I saw very early that there was a, uh, some potential for uh, using these advertisements as, uh, or targeting these advertisements for curation. And so, um, you know, Rebecca and Anna and Jeff and Jeremy and I'm probably missing other people, David, who, you know, Elizabeth, uh, who I'll mention later, my colleague Brian Croxall at BYU, they were all involved in this redigitization project, and that's where this came from. Uh, so, there we go, we're back. Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, I, I, I failed to mention that because ads were reprinted over and over again, there are 328 unique advertisements in them, but a total of 4,000 printings of advertisements. All right, so what are some uses of this? Well, Digital humanities, we got to make a graph, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the total number of advertisements that appeared by year in the, in the newspaper. Oh, that's, sorry, I didn't know you guys could see that too. Um, and one of the ideas that we had early on was to, to, to kind of use this as a surrogate for the economic, economic viability of the newspaper and try to decide whether or not these peaks and valleys coincided with any major political or social events of the time period. The two big ones being, uh, the Edmunds Tucker Act that legalized polygamy and stripped uh, women in Utah of the right to vote, um, and the Utah statehood. Really, there's there does not appear to be any sort of um, correlation to, to these changes. Uh, we don't know why the uh, advertisements peaked in 1878 and dropped off precipitously. Uh, that would be a you know subject for investigation, but can't really tell that from here. 
by the way, this uh, chart is the, there we go, uh, is this graph right here that the, that the website can make for you as well. And then also, if we look by industry, say, for example, the general stores, you can see that that um, you know, tip, our traditional retail was very prominent in the newspaper um, up until about 1888, and then it just dropped off the charts. Uh, travel, uh, you know, the Intercontinental Railroad was, was completed over here, but we really don't get a prominent um, appearance of uh, railroad advertising until you know, the late 1880s and into the early 1900s. And then finally, banking has a similar thing like this. These are entirely advertisements for Zions Bank, entirely. And I'll, uh, that will come back up um, in another slide as well. So those are some of the things you can do with, with a database uh, like this. But I'm more interested in using this data to support and carry out research. So at Mormon History Association this summer, Elizabeth Smart from BYU's library, she's our digital humanities librarian and teaches in our women's studies program. Um, she and I presented at MHA, and this was kind of a proof of concept for what you could do with, these kind, with this kind of information. And I like to think of um, looking through advertisements as kind of digging, digging through historical garbage because nobody makes an advertisement with the idea that it's gonna be preserved and reviewed in 50 or 100 or 150 years. They're making an advertisement for a specific purpose at a specific time. And so there's less of a filter, I wanna say. It, 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 it establishes a, a more of a perception of economic reality than what we might get from an editorial. So what Elizabeth did that was so brilliant was she looked for editorials critiquing women's fashion so you have to understand that the Women's Exponent was the women's newspaper for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Salt Lake City. And some notable names like Emmeline D. Wells uh, were editors. And there were several times uh, editorials uh, critiquing the worldly fashions of the day, particularly taking aim at French fashions and corsets and things like that. Um, and what was interesting was to see the way that advertising would mention fashion and that when the first uh, editorial against that, those kind of fashions appeared, this uh, advertisement, which had been there from the beginning, Mrs. Wilkinson's uh, Bazaar of Fashion disappeared in that issue. Um, it did come back, I, I believe six months later, but, but other places continued to, to advertise for these kinds of fashions. There was even a French hair store that was advertising throughout the, uh, you know, the, the period where these critiques were being made. So there seems to be some, uh, some dissonance between, uh, or, or perhaps, you know, the, the advertising proves the need for these editorials, right? That, it's, that, that people were buying these things, but there does not appear to have been an editorial privilege over the advertising because there, there doesn't, uh, except for that one case, there doesn't appear to be much reaction between them. But this is the kind of advertising that I really like, or kind of research that I really like because it's looking at sort of the internal consistency of the newspaper and finding violations of that internal consistency through the advertising that appears. Okay, oops, okay. Uh, in terms of research support, it was fun walking around the uh, MHA and seeing a poster for, um, I believe it was um, Ellis Shipp. There was a graduate student who had done some research on Ellis Shipp, who was an early woman physician in Utah. And I actually have scores of advertisements that, that for example, this one here is from Romania Pratt, who was another uh, female physician, but it states that she is uh, upstairs in the old constitution building. Right, and so we and and we we have announcements in the um, in the advertisements of when they move uh, their office to another building. We have their telephone numbers sometimes, their early three-digit telephone numbers. So uh, you know we can support research in that way. If you're doing any sort of research on a historical person who might have taken up advertising at this time, you can search the database and, and get more information on them. Same thing. The second one is is uh, Zina Young, Zina Zina. I've heard it both ways. Um, one of Brigham Young's wives, uh, who was very involved in the silk trade in Utah. And here, this is an advertisement that she's selling um, silkworm eggs from her residence. $4 per ounce, it says. Uh, and then finally, let's take a look. Uh, if I go to search, and I just search for sewing machines, um, you can see, you know, weed sewing machines. Oops. Down here, you have the 
premium distribution. Oh, wait, nope. so, oh, th this is interesting. The reason this came up is because this is actually um, the Salt Lake Semi-Weekly Herald giving away prizes for subscriptions, including a sewing machine. Right there, sewing machines. So you can, you can win $100 down to $5 valuable horn stock. So cattle, you can win from subscribing to the Semi-Weekly. But those are just some of the things that you can do um, or that you could search to support uh, resources would be very much a secondary uh, resource for uh, historical research. This one I really like um, because it, 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 it's one of those moments when you're reading something and it hits you, like you, you come to realize the depth of something that was never meant to be deep. But for 10 years, Zions Bank, which was a, you know, is a, I don't know if it still is, but it was a wholly owned subsidiary of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. You can see Wilford Woodruff, who was the fourth president of, of the church, uh, is the president of the bank here as well. But for 10 years, Zion Savings Bank and Trust ran this advertisement that included this verbiage. The laws of Utah permit married women and also children who are minors to open savings accounts in their own name, subject to their own order, meaning their own control. Have you such an account? If not, open one now. And my collaborator, Elizabeth Spark, she would point out that because there was so much home industry going on at this time, this was not just a call for women to take the allowance their husbands were giving them and put it into the bank, that there was serious economic activity happening between women and amongst uh, uh, the female population at the time. But for me, it's this idea that the bank has to inform the readers of what the laws of the land allow them to do, right? And you know, we, we've done some... Uh, some further research on this and you know things that I didn't know from my position of privilege were that you know in the United States women were required to receive their husband's permission to get a credit card into the 70s you know and that there wasn't laws protecting them in that way but this just you know it, it, it really just that the fact that the bank would need to state this for 10 years in their advertisements really it's one of those insightful things that, that you get from digging through the trash All right, another one that, that, that I like uh, is the, uh, the railway systems published uh, fares, their uh, fare schedule to, to different places in Utah, including places that no longer exist, such as Frisco, which I had no idea it was there. So I got on Wikipedia and found this picture of a ghost town. You, you can still visit it today, but it was a railway stop for the Union Pacific Railroad. Um, I can't remember which one it was, and I didn't have time to look it up, but there are places on here that we don't know where they, they are now. They're, you know, they were towns somewhere between these two towns because they're on the train schedule, but they're totally gone. There's no, no remnant of them. Uh, so that's, that's, this is, again, a, a little piece of um, historical information that may not be preserved in many other places. So, and then we come to the oddities. And these are the funnest things usually to look at because, you know, we can laugh from our perch of enlightenment back on the, on the past. Of, you know, the American Institute of Phrenology advertising their their session to open September 3rd, 1902, or uh, the Viavi treatment, which was a treatment for female ailments, which I did find some contemporary medical associations um, rebuttal, let's put it that way, of, of their methods. It was pretty much snake oil. And then down here at the bottom, uh, Mrs. H.K. Painter, MD, electric physician, electricity <laughs> administered when cases require. Okay, so that was kind of interesting as well. And then this was my favorite oddity found. And this one is odd because, well, you have to know quite a bit of Mormon history to understand, but the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints traces, traces its origins to Joseph Smith, who was led by an angel to find some golden plates that were buried in a hill in Western New York. And that hill is in, near the village of Palmyra. And this was an advertisement that appeared in two issues of the Women's Exponent of someone named Major Gilbert, who lives in Palmyra and is offering to sell authentic or genuine specimens of stone or wood collected from the site to uh, members of the church in Utah for 25 cents or photographs for addition additional prices. The reason this ad is so interesting is that it contains several reverse shibboleths. That is to say that, this, uh, that Major Gilbert in this advertisement refers to locations and objects using terms that the people in Palmyra would use, but would not be accepted amongst the general population of Mormons living in Utah at the time. Uh, the Golden Bible, for example, to refer to the Book of Mormon, or Mormon Hill, the Mormons would call it the Hill Cumorah. 
And so this is a very interesting case of an advertiser not actually speaking the language of the audience that they're trying to advertise to. This is also interesting because at MHA this summer, uh, one of the keynotes was given by the official historian of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, LeGrand Curtis. And his entire topic was the church's preservation of this hill near Palmyra, New York. And so I ran into him after another session and I pulled out my cell phone and was able to pull up this advertisement to show it to him. And we laughed about it. He thought that was fun. And when I turned to leave, he said, no, I want a copy. <laughs> so he gave me his business card so I could send him a, a link to the database where he could find this uh, because he had, I mean, this is the official church historian. This is somebody who specializes in this specific topic. And yet he had never seen or heard of this advertisement before. All right, so other ideas. What other things could you do with advertisements? Oh, did I get the, oh, I got the Willard Marriott name wrong. Oh, I'll fix that. Super close. A super close. Slightly name. wrong. It, it, it's J Willard and I put Willard J. Oh, I'm so sorry. I should have known it's a Utah name. Of course it's <laughs> initial first. <laughs> Excuse my ignorance, but I don't know how far back like the official general conference practices were with that, but mm -hmm. were there any connections that you could stack between advertisements and announcements made at those conferences? Look at the top of the uh, of the train table. Conference rates. Yeah, the Union Pacific Railroad offered specials oh. in October and April for people to come to the general conference. Now, general conference today is generally two days. At the time, I believe it was five days long. It was, you know, they had meetings all week long. Um, and so, yeah, no, this, it, it, there is here uh, evidence of that. Um, there are advertisements from clothing shops saying, hey, come see our fall collection while you're in town for general conference. And so, no, this is, yeah, I mean, 150 years ago, we were still doing that. So it's not just twice a year when you have to deal with traffic in downtown Salt Lake. It's <laughs> <laughs> and last, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. And yes, we do have that. Although, in, in fact, actually, I mean, let's conduct some original research right now. Um, let's search conference. So here's ladies who read the exponent. I will receive in time for the territorial fair and general conference, one of the largest mm -hmm. assortments of books, stationaries, et cetera. So yeah, there's, there's plenty. Uh, here, here's, oh, that's interesting. For the conference trade, stores West Side East Temple Street. I don't know what that means, but it looks like, uh, I don't know if that's referring to general conference or not, but yeah, there are several mentions of, of conference um, in, these, in these advertisements. So ladies attending conference will do well to give her a call, which she says. So visitors to conference, right? So yeah. I'm also curious um, if you, you give the, the example of the one ad that uh, was selling rocks and photographs, mm -hmm being that the person was an outsider targeting uh, the women that were audience. So I wonder if there um, were more advertisements, not from local companies, local enterprises, mm -hmm. but other outside companies targeting for whatever reason the women that were audience. Yeah, and, and there, there were a few, I, the, the, the great majority of the advertisements were homegrown, um, but, but there are uh, many of them. I haven't done that much work on them, we can browse entirely by vendor. And so like there, there's the Mormon Hill Excavation Company right there, that's that one. Uh, the Oregon Short Line Railroad would be another one that was uh, from the outside. Um, but, but by and large, these are, these are locals. Um, you know, Deseret Tanning and Manufacturing would be local. Uh, Bishop Jasper Peterson, I believe he was looking for a- Dunford, you know, Dunford? Dunford, I believe, yeah. So we have A.B. Dunford and Dunfords. I think they're the same one, but they are um, shoes and slippers. <laughs> so yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Any other questions or comments? Anything? I don't know if I have a question exactly, but I, I really liked hearing about contrasting sort of like the editorial position on on uh, fashion with advertisements. And um, when I was kind of looking into uh, women doctors of the time period, it was really interesting to me to see like the exponent coverage of some of these women and their ads, and then in some cases, editorials or, or things written by them. And so that, that interplay just between how the exponent would sometimes feature these notable women, the women 
writing in it and then advertisements you know mentioning them is is just kind of an interesting area i think yeah and the ellis and maggie ship story mm -hmm. is something that i had no clue about before i started this project but just simply from seeing um you know their uh, their advertisers these are two women who had gone back east to get their medical education and then came back to practice in utah um you know and that's almost like a a, a movie kind of yeah. or a mini series that i'd yeah. want to see on netflix right yeah it was interesting but about that. so so this this database does not have the ability yet to connect mm -hmm. right but uh you know we have redigitized and ocr the women's exponent and it's currently last i checked it was more than two-thirds of the way hand corrected mm -hmm. yeah so so we're getting close to where we'll be able to you know it would be easy to link these these two things together that would be amazing Do that yeah. yeah put that in our notes I was actually talking to the director of Eccles Health Science Library, and we were talking about the unique story of women doctors in Utah and how that's not really represented like on the walls mm. of the medical school or library there, that it's just really a bunch of men. But we have such an interesting history here in Utah of, you know, it's like a lot of female doctors. I mean, at one point, wasn't Deseret Hospital all women doctors? I'm getting nods. I, <laughs> you're, you're getting beyond my room. Well, I work at the Super Place Heritage Park, and we have the Desert oh. Hospital in Delta Lake Health. Yeah. Okay. So I feel like I have heard that before. I mean, that's interesting history that I feel like got lost for a long time, mm -hmm. but possibly could be like we can in our in uh, yeah in our exhibit we have a picture of the board the board of directors right, right, right. is all women. Uh, so huh. I'm thinking of ways that we could rectify that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and there, there are links that can be made. So, for example, remember I, I showed that Romania Pratt had an office in the Constitution Building. Well, here is your own website. Yep. And there's a picture of the old Constitution Building. Mm -hmm. uh, number one hit on Google Images, by the way, for old Constitution oh, Building. We're office. so good. So. <laughs> <laughs> the, one funny thing, though, that came up, though, was, I mean, quite a ways down, though, uh, was one of the advertisements from my database. Oh, that's great. Oh. And it was it was for, I can't remember, I think it was for a, a sewing machine with a, a woodcut illustration on it, uh, because it was being sold out of the old Constitution Building as well. That's funny. And so, yeah. Okay. Well. Great. We can move on to the next part of my presentation, which is the technology that has to go into this system. And this really hit me again. This was one of those moments of, oh, what have I done at MHA? Because we presented in a digital humanities slash digital history session, including uh, you know, some people from, from this very group. And uh, somebody asked the question, hey, that's really cool. What do I need to do to be able to do this? And I have been literally working neck deep in technology for 25 years, right? Being paid to do this, not counting my high school years of hacking around on an old IBM. Um, and so I was, I, I listed out all of the technology that I used to build the system. And uh, nothing earth shattering. These are not things that you need to have a doctoral degree in computer science to know how to use, but you do need to have experience in using them. You know, to, um, but they are readily available. I used absolutely zero proprietary software to build this. It was all free software that came along. All right, so let's talk about the process of getting from the scanned newspaper into the database. The first thing we have to do is we have to crop out all of the advertisements, 4,000 advertisements. The second thing we need to do is OCR, which is to, to take the image and, tra and transfer it into text, into a text file. Then we need to group all of those advertisements by vendor and then by individual advertisement. Uh, then there's some hand correction to be done, and then there's a website to be built. The asterisks indicate steps where I wrote custom software. So every single step. Of the way. Here's what I'll actually show you a live demonstration of this tool. Uh, this is, we initially called it Cropper, but that's actually the last name of one of our associate deans. <laughs> so we changed it to Boxer. We call it the, the, the Boxer uh, website. This is just a, a, it's password protected, so you can't visit it, but it just pulls up each paper. By the way, this is not the women's exponent. You might have noticed this is the next project that Elizabeth and I are working on, which is the anti polygamy standard, which ought to show some interesting contrasts. But I would be, and this works really well if you have a tablet with a stylus, but I can, you know, I would uh, pull up this, uh, where is it going? There it is. I would uh, pull up a website and I would just click and click, and then I could click and click 
And if I make a mistake and I get too much, I can just click on it and it goes away. And all of these clicks are being recorded in a database. So it's recording the, the, the coordinates of each box. Um, and then when I'm done with this page, I can go to the next page. And you can see here are some bigger advertisements, which I would probably zoom out on to do. Um, but just from a cursory glance of the anti-polygamy standard, they share zero advertisers with the women's exponent. Makes sense to different audiences. Oh, to very, very different audiences, right? <laughs> So that's the that's the Boxer program that uh, just a simple website that we wrote to um, to be able to crop out these four thousand advertisements. And it actually, it doesn't take long. Again, if you're doing something else like you know I'm watching a football game in but in between plays, I can get four or five of these things marked off, and then it doesn't take long before you have all four thousand. Then there's a separate Python script that I wrote that will take the, that coordinate information for each picture and then make copies of those sections. Um, down here, you can see I'm actually adding some buffer. So it's, it's, it's enlarging the crop mark a little bit to make sure that we, uh, um, that we get what we're looking for. And then the next step is to do optical character recognition. Uh, what do you guys use here in the library? Abby or what, what's, what are the big OCR we programs? We use Abby and we've also used Tesseract, Tesseract as well. well. Yeah. So Abby, I find to give excellent results, but it's a lot more difficult to script. So Tesseract, which is made by Google, is an OCR system that um, has a Python library. And what I do here, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give up some trade secrets here. <laughs> but if you've ever done OCR on old documents, you know that the contrast level is super important. It's really important to, to, to get it just to the right point where you haven't lost enough detail that, you, that the letters are gonna be recognized, but where there's not enough fuzziness that it's gonna be confused. So, what our system does is it actually runs each, each advertisement five times at different levels of adjustment. And then it counts the dictionary words greater than three letters long that it can find. And it assumes that the more dictionary words it finds, the clearer the transcription was. And so of course it takes time, but we can let it run overnight. And um, we get, you know, it, it auto selects which, uh, which adjustment level was optimal. So. That's one of the benefits that come from being able to script rather than just having to use um, some sort of interface. So I was left with 4,000 advertisements and their text transcription. So it actually came to over 9,000 files when all was said and done. And now I get to go through each one and hand categorize it by vendor, um, by industry, and by advertising. Of course, I didn't want to do that, right? My other option was, this is, I try to protect his anonymity in some ways, but to call an old buddy from uh, graduate school <laughs> who uh, works on, at the, I have to move my little panel down here. Ah. You guys can't see where there is. He works at the National Bio, uh, Bioforensic Analysis and Countermeasure Center. He's a geneticist. Just so you know, we can see it. It just blocks oh, yours. It just blocks mine. Okay, so it's just up here. You guys <laughs> yeah. can see it just fine. All right. I mean, I'll see it yeah, you can see it on Zoom. Because there is um, a continuing relationship between genetic sequencing and text sequencing, right? They, you, we can use a lot of their methods in the humanities as we process large pieces of text. And so he gave me a couple of methods to use. It was actually a fascinating phone call to have and have just explain to him my situation and for him to say, oh yeah, that's exactly what we do. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened instead was um, I, I had misreported at one point that we used Jacquard similarity index, but no, we used Levenstein distance. Levenstein distance is simply how many changes has to happen to a string of text to make it identical to another, right? So here we have four sentences, and here we have a table that shows how many changes would have to happen to make uh, text A become text B and so forth. Now, if you attended um, David's uh, Gephi graph seminar a few weeks ago, you know that we can plot these distances. And so he, oh, by, by the way, I have to show it is computationally intensive because instead of having, you know, he, oops, here we have uh, four texts by four texts. So we have 16 crosses. I have over 4,000. So that's 16 million cells in this table, right? So the computer uh, goes crazy while we're doing it. But this is a graph that shows all 4,000 advertisements plotted out based on their distance from one another in terms of Levenstein. And so, you know, these are probably, if not the same vendor, they're the same industry because they're using very similar uh, text in their advertisements. 
And then of course, if two texts were identical, they will, would appear directly on top of each other. Well, um, you also know from, from David's presentation that the computer can detect communities. That is to say that if some of the nodes on this graph are highly interconnected and less connected with the nodes around them, that they might be a community. And specifically, I use Louvain community detection, which if you go to Wikipedia, this is the uh, algorithm for it, which I simplify to this. Okay, because there is a Python library that will do community detection for us. And when I ran that on it, it separated the 4,000 advertisements into 172 groups, plus some that I labeled orphan. And I'll show you what those look like in a minute. And it worked really well. That is to say that the computer was able to group all of these advertisements together, especially when they're word for word the same. Formatting doesn't matter because we're dealing with the text, not with the font. And so all of the, the computer recognized that all of these belonged together, even though they changed the format of the advertisement. Now it's not perfect. This is here we have Ellis ship, Maggie's ship, and I believe there's a Romania Pratt in here somewhere. Um, but yeah, and the doctor's ship down here. But the computer found enough similarity in these that it put them all together in one group, representing more an industry than an individual. I would still rather go through 170 folders with that have been pre-grouped and just correct that than have to do a complete uh, categorization using uh, 4,000 uh, images and text files. But there's a cool part about that Levenstein algorithm that we use, which is that community detection is relative. That is to say, you might, if, if we did, um, you know, everybody in this group, if we did your Facebook friends, and ran community detection on it, we would see who are um, David's friends and who are Comstock's friends and so forth. But then we could take David's group and run community detection on it as well. And we would find who are his cousins, who are his immediate family and so forth. And so I could rerun that community detection within the group and get a different result. So this is on that midwife group and it found 15 subgroups inside of it, which was a lot more accurate. Here you can see all Maggie ship. And then not perfect though, but here's why. So on the left, you have a class in obstetrics by Dr. Maggie C. Ship. On the right, you have one by Dr. Romania B. Pratt. But look at the text. We'll commence a class in obstetrics on versus we'll commence another class on obstetrics about. And so the computer thought these are similar enough compared to how different the other ads are to put them together. So it's not perfect, but it greatly accelerated the rate at which we could um, classify these, uh, these advertisements. All right. In terms of the orphaned advertisements, if you look at them, they're largely um, damaged or highly illustrated um, uh, advertisements. And so the computer had a hard time finding text in it and therefore couldn't attach them to any, any group. Oh, that's the advertisement that pops up when you search the old constitution. Okay. So hand correction. This was another fun part. Um, like many areas of campus, we employ, oh, there's, we employ a number of students in our office who oftentimes are waiting for people to help. And so we will sometimes give them tasks, whether it's transcription or review of something um, to do in their downtime. And so this was the interface we created for them for that. And the idea is here are all of the examples of this advertisement. And we would like you to click on what you see as being the exemplary version of it. And then down below, there's the, there's the um, transcription provided by Tesseract. They corrected that. And then we have a few fields down here, which we haven't done anything with yet, but they put the names of people that are mentioned, the address, if there is one, direction, excuse me, if there are any, and a telephone number if there are any. So the students were able to go through all 300 advertisements that way and do some hand error correction. Okay. And then finally, building the website. And I had, you know, I could use any of the free website options out there. And I looked at all of them and I said, nah, <laughs> let's roll our own. <laughs> I was feeling a little uppity at the time. I think I was <laughs> depressed because we had had some plugin on WordPress break and I was tired of depending on other people to do it. But something that amazed me because it had been so long since I had written a website for the ground up, despite the fact that I teach classes on that, is just how simple the code gets when you write it yourself because it's for a very narrow case. It's not generalized out to anybody else that might want to use the same system. So this is the entire code here for that index page. 
you know, it's 38 lines. Now I am including other pieces of code remotely, but you know, it was pretty easy. It wasn't hard at all to do. I mean, for somebody who's experienced and better is that I, I have the feeling that, that this code is going to be stable for longer than the other um, generalized systems would be because I'm, I'm using very few functions and they're all locked down tight. You know, it, it's kind of like the difference between a canoe versus the Titanic. So, so, you know, that's how I built the website. Okay. Questions, comments, ideas, criticisms? My comment is it's very cool. <laughs> Thank you, <Mike. laughs> and thanks so much for uh, showing us your work. And I'm wondering uh, like where, where you see this going mm -hmm. next. Yeah, so um, we have, so there is a feedback section. There's a form on here for people to leave comments, whether they find errors such as the, it's Jay Willard and not Willard Jay. Um, and so that I can go in and correct that or suggestions or just, just general questions. Nobody has used that form yet. I haven't gotten a single comment for it. Um, and, and so that's that's a little frustrating, but at the same time, um, and I'll show you in a minute that, that this, this has made waves because it is a cool project, right? And I think it was worth doing, um, but for next steps, we'd like to add the anti polygamous standard there. Um, you know, and see, I, I can use the same interface. All I have to do is add a field for, you know, which, which uh, newspaper this came out of. And, and we'd be able to, to keep them separate to do comparisons and so forth. It'd be really interesting to do that. I think. Now, I am not a, a historian of Utah by trade. And so I'm not the person who would ultimately use this for that kind of research. And that's probably its, its biggest weakness. So, so yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you for saying this. Shout out to Amy Easton Blake at BYU, who's her area of research is on the women's exponent and anti polygamy standards. You know, I think Elizabeth has, has. I have not directly, though. And so that would be interesting. I've been in, a, I think, one meeting with her. Yeah. Uh, but, but it didn't come She'd up. She'd probably so. be a great collaborator because That's, this is like a very specific area of interest for her. That's a good point. And I, I do have to say that there are several um, faculty in our religious history department who I've the, the whole OCR thing I've spun off to um, a, a staff member who's a, an awesome developer named Jesse. And he has been working to, to OCR a huge number of publications from uh, the Community of Christ, which was the reorganized church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They had a magazine or they have a magazine that they've published consistently for you know, over 150 years. And so we, and, and it's publicly available, but in image format. So we have that. Um, the Young Women's Journal, which was another publication here in Salt Lake, uh, we've done. And so we do have members of the, of the um, history, of the, the religious history department at BYU that, that have been taking advantage of similar things like this. But you're right, I haven't quite approached them yet to say, hey, what do you think about, about these advertisements? Because that would be interesting. Yeah. We thought about um, wrapping up the uh, software and a package because it's you know, subject not agnostic, right? It could, it could be, but that, that wasn't my goal when I created it. Um, there is a lot of overhead that goes into, you know, um, uh, you know, putting it up somewhere so that somebody else could load their data into it. I think that the tools that I use to create the data set would be much more um, amenable to that than the website itself. So for example, that, 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 Boxer program where you know it's an online system for cropping out things on, on from a collection of images that might actually be a, a prime candidate to go on to GitHub or something like that so that other people can use it. So yeah. Okay. I'm not done. <laughs> <laughs> not done yet. Okay. Uh, so I, I put up this list of what I do. And this is this is something that's been weighing on my mind pretty heavily since 2015, and you'll see why. Um, but this characterization of digital humanities work that gets attention. Bigger tends to be better, right? Your corpora are measured in, in billions of words um, or number of documents that you have in your archive. And the impact is often measured by counting users or citations or something like that. And we still have competitive grant funding, which is zero sum. And we still have this territorial owning of space, right? I mean, this is a great accomplishment to have your own space. And that just screams to me, I'm sorry, but toxic masculinity. And you know, thankfully, in the digital humanities from its inception in the early 2000s has always been open and collaborative. 
but it's still we're still fighting against some of those you know more traditional or you know um, ancien regime ways of doing things. So in 2015, I was at uh, DH in Australia, and I have been searching high and low for the person who said this, but I'm afraid that they didn't actually put it in their paper, which is why I can't find it. But it was a, a woman presenter who talked about big data and DH and men comparing the size of their tools once again. Okay. And then this is a great book if you don't have it, look it up. It's uh, Liz Losh's uh, edited uh, volume on intersectional feminism and the digital humanities. And it provides some really interesting arguments against a lot of the ways that traditional academic procedures bleed into the digital humanities. This is from, uh, or this is a quote of Martha Neal Nell Smith. It's in one of the chapters. These matters of objective and hard science provided an oasis for folks who did not want to clutter sharp disciplined methodological philosophy with considerations of gender, race, and class determined facts of life. Or uh, Rupert Boyd and Howe, who explored how uh, what queer thinking could bring to the digital humanities. Right. And then this last one is the one that, that, that most resonates with me in this project is challenges of trying to do anti-racist coalitional feminist work in the context of non-feminist institutional structure. That is to say that many of the criticisms that I would have of this project that I did myself is it's small, it's parochial, it's you know got limited applicability, no one's ever going to look at it. But at the same time, those are all criticisms that come from this, you know, sexist uh, model that we have in the, in the institution. So if we look at these collaborations that I've done, none of these projects that I listed were independent. They were all collaborative in some way or another. The stars are the collaborative ones, so they're all starred. And then I put um, a little Venus symbol next to the, uh, to the women collaborators that I worked with and a tall S next to ones that were students, graduates and undergraduates who I worked with. And this is probably what I'm most proud about is that I've been able to reach out across campus and help so many people with their research. And that makes me wonder if we don't need different criteria for impact in the digital humanities. Um, on the left is the multimedia dictionary of Quechua idiophones, which I worked on with Dr. Janice Knuckles from our linguistics department and her students. If this site goes down, it'll be two weeks before I hear about it. Okay, because there are probably only seven people in the world actively using it. But when I, just two years after we started that project, when I asked Dr. Knuckles for an update on what she's doing for it, she listed four articles slash book chapters that are either published, forthcoming, or in progress. And then I think seven different presentations that she'd given in the matter of two or three years. Because once her data could be organized in this manner, it became super impactful to her. So do we need a different measure for impact? The one on the right is the 16th century French religious pamphlets project. Yes, again, you can probably fit everyone who's interested in that in a small room. But the professor I helped out with this based his tenure dossier on it. It was hugely impactful. Similarly, this is a project uh, that I did um, last spring with the University of Utah Masters of Public Health students on uh, basically doing text analysis on 10,000 articles and news broadcasts referring to masks and mask mandates during the, um, during the pandemic. Uh, I should have looked at the professor's name, but the professor was so, uh, uh, was so appreciative of this work that she su suggested that the student Byron Montgomery and I uh, turn this into a paper and submit it to the American Journal of Public Health. And again, we haven't done that yet because Byron is now a certified, certified practitioner in public health, and he's waiting until next year so he can get professional development credit for writing the paper. Okay. Again, hugely impactful to him, but I'm never even, well, unless I go to some public, or public health conference, I'm never, going to be, uh, uh, I'm never going to be presenting on that myself. Similarly, you have this project. The BYU News picked it up around Pioneer Day. They thought this was a great uh, project to highlight during Pioneer Day. So there's Elizabeth and myself. Um, and they ran a story on it. And then abc4.com picked it up and wrote a, a piece on it. Why? Well, because it's interesting to people around here. Right? Even if it's not a, a ton of use, it's not a really terribly useful to historians. Um, it is interesting to people around here. And for a moment, cast some of their minds back to the pioneer heritage that we have here and some of the struggles that um, that women in particular faced in early Salt Lake civilization, our societies. So that's what I've got. 
thank you so much for your time and your attention. I appreciate it. And Jeremy, I think from a, a library science perspective too, I see so much of what you're doing and it feels like collections is data work. You're taking collections that we already have and figuring out how to make data sets that people can play with computationally. So I think, you know, to different audiences, your work is going to mean different things, but both with your mask mandate work and the historical newspapers, you're turning library collections into data sets. Yeah, and what is, what is the chicken and the egg in this case, right? I mean, when you're in library, how do you determine, oh, gee, it's worthwhile to go through and tag all the metadata on this, on this collection because somebody could use it? Or is it, hey, this is low-hanging fruit, so let's tag that? I mean, what's the process for that? Well, <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna a I don't know if, if we have a real uh, structured process because so far when we've been sort of doing similar work, developing, you know, small or large data sets, we've, we've looked at things that appear to be interesting to us, mm -hmm. you know, and done the extra work and released them. And in, in some cases, um, folks have done some things with that. And in some cases, I don't know, you know, so not yet, not yet, not yet. But I think it's, I think it's worth going through this kind of process, because it really, in my case, you know, I start thinking about digitized collections in different ways, and different potential uses of that, other than just putting something online in a digital repository, and, and calling it done, mm -hmm. you know, so. That's kind of a non-answer. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions on mine yet? Really fascinating work. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm not going to deny that. <laughs> <laughs> this this was one of those projects where I never actually had to say, oh, I got to work on that project again. Right. And I think part of it is because it's not an area of content matter specialty for myself. And so I'm coming up with questions and I'm asking Elizabeth these questions. Like, well, I just found this. What's going on here? Or, you know, Googling Romania Pratt and saying, wow, that was a fascinating, a fascinating woman, mm -hmm. you know? And so the fact that I was learning something every step of the way, um, just, you know, it kept me going. So. I think a lot of us on the Women's Exponent Project felt that way. It was really fascinating content to dig into. Mm -hmm. And I just kept thinking, why don't we know more of this stuff? Like we know a lot of the male leaders in the early Mormon church mm -hmm. or hear their names or lots of things are named after them, but I had never heard of Romania Pratt or Ellis Ship or any of these Okay, so I'm going to reveal something to you, but um, I, Romania Pratt, I had never heard of, but do you know where I had heard Emmeline B. Wells and Ship and um, Richards and uh, so at BYU, they torn them down, but there used to be a set of dormitories that were the apartment style dormitories and historically that had been an exclusively women's um, uh, uh, dorm area. Mm -hmm. And so all of the buildings were named after historical women mm -hmm. in, um, and, but they've all been torn down and replaced with numbered buildings instead. Mm -hmm. And so, but yeah, you're right. We don't know much about them. I mean, but the, the fact that the only thing that I had known about them was that this building where, you know, a girl I dated when I was an undergraduate lived was, you know, <laughs> that was, that was the name of her hall. Oh um, yeah, that's, you know, and, and so then the next question is what can we do about it? Right. You know, I would think with this, this Deseret hospital thing, do they have a place where they have pictures of all of the boards, right? Because if not, hey, let's, you know, and even if the boards at some point transitioned into male, right, we can go back and show that there was this predominantly female board or an entirely female board in the beginning, you know, to, to draw attention to the, 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 the feminine origins of the institution. And, and yeah, not just having the image, but having it be super visible in the hospital or medical school or library, because mm -hmm. I'm sure it exists in like the medical history room, but it's not being... No. But, and, and although these women offered midwife services and training for midwives, they were not nurses, they were not midwives, they were physicians, they were full-fledged licensed MDs. And, you know, a lot of times when we see these pictures of, of women from, you know, the late 19th century uh, in a medical situation, you know, our bias tends to project them into one of those roles. Mm -hmm. So I really, I, I, I can't get enough of, of those stories we found through this. Uh, did you text in your research, uh, because the women's exponents uh, was continued at some point, um, was there a shift in advertising that led to the demise of the paper or made it less profitable or anything? I don't have any evidence on, on, on what led to that. Um, it was replaced by the Relief Society magazine, 
Um, I, I just, there was such a long period towards the end of the run. I mean, but it was decades long that there was um, very little advertising. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the last decade, we're talking one or two, maybe three advertisements per issue. And so I, I'm thinking at that point, they might have been, they were either supported by subscription fees, uh, by you know, uh, direct support from the church as an institution, or they had started running a deficit. You know, some, some, there's some explanation like that, but I don't have any evidence to explain that, but there is this obvious diminishing in their advertising revenue. Again. Was there like one holdout that kept advertising for the past <laughs> 10 years? Well, I mean, one of the, um, here, let's, because we can go to browse and we can go to 1914. Yep, Ellis Ship and R.K. Thomas, who was a, um, uh, you know, a clothing, uh, sales, but yeah, ran through many, many, many of, uh, of the issues. But yeah, you can see that they only had two advertisers in that last year, 1913, Ellis Ship, R.K. Thomas. Oh, and then this this map for Book of Mormon study, which is funny because there's a, there, this is a hot topic of debate on Twitter right now too. So <laughs> some things never change. But yeah, you can see they only had a, you know, just, you know, you could count their advertisers on one hand through the last uh, several years of their, um, of their run. So yeah, that, that, that's a topic to investigate. Why, what happened? I think that's something I love about your projects. It's not that they always are answering the questions, but they're pointing to questions that could be investigated. Yeah, and um, Dr. Cole, what's Dr. Cole's, uh, the Pomage project? Uh, Kate Cole. Cole, yeah. Her and I had an argument in 2017 at DH in Montreal. We were on the same side of the argument. We were arguing with a young European graduate student who had attended my session where I made this point. And it's not original to me, uh, Jeffrey Rockwell and Stefan St. St. Clair, who created the Voyant tools. They see digital humanities as very much a playground, but just like kids learn on the playground, we're learning from playing with these tools. Um, and the questions that they develop in our minds that drive us deeper into the text are what's really valuable. Um, and so the argument that, that this, you know, in, in Europe, the digital humanities is seen much more from a positivist lens. So he did not take well to this idea that, you know, the, the real value is in, Get generating the questions that we can then, you know, uh, go back to the text to try to answer. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's exactly what this kind of project does. So you explore these things and you questions start to pop up in your mind. Well, do we have anything from Zoomers? If not, um, let's thank Jeremy once again. Thank you guys. And yeah, Boyan Tools does rock. You should do a, another session of this on Boyan. A lot of fun to do that. Yeah. All right. Thank Spring you. Spring 2022. <laughs> <laughs>